Welcome to Playmakers, episode eight. I'm your host, Jordan Blackman, and on every episode, I interview a game industry leader, legend, or luminary, and I dive deep into their expertise to help you learn things that are gonna help you achieve creative and business success in the game industry. This week, we have Robin Hunnicky. She's worked on The Sims. She's got a new studio phenomenon that's doing some really cool stuff. We talk about her unique and artistic approach to game making in this episode of Plemacus. Plamacus. It's not actually pronounced Plamacus, FYI. All right, enough goofing around. Let's talk about Robin Hunnicky. So Robin is someone who really has had a truly luminary career in the game industry. She's worked on games including The Sims, including Journey. She's doing incredible stuff at uh, her new studio Phenomena, and that's F-U-N, Phenomena. And on top of all that, she teaches game design at UC Santa Cruz. So uh, we talk about a lot of things. First of all, we learn a little bit about her unique path into the industry. Then we spend some time talking about uh, her approach to making games. And it's an approach that has consistently produced some really amazing, interesting, beautiful, emotionally affecting games. Now, she is known, in fact, for an emotionally uh, aware approach and and a, an approach that involves putting the emotions that are desired for the game to create front and center. So we talk about that. And also because she's a, she accomplishes so much and does so much, I also talked to her a little bit about her productivity processes and how she does all that stuff. You know, I mean, you go to the Phenomena page and there's so many cool games being worked on there and working at UC Santa Cruz and she gives back to the gaming community at GDC, and uh, and she's an amazing guest on this show as well. So just an incredible person all around. Very excited to share this interview with Robin Hunnicky. You're listening to Plamacas. Robin, it is so great to have you on the show. Thanks for coming on. Um, thank you so much for having me. So I wanted to start with learning about your inspiration about what brought you into the industry and how that happened because you bring a very unique voice to your work and it's different than a lot of games. And so I'm curious your path into games. Yeah, you know, it's funny. I started off uh, as a curious child, <laughs> someone who loved to play with Legos and, and make things. Um, I grew up in upstate New York in a tiny town called Saratoga Springs, which is right near Skidmore College. Mm. It's a horse town. I was outside most of my young adult life, so I spent a lot of time climbing and building and playing in the snow. And my dad was a was an engineer and a builder, and my mom is actually a history buff, but also and a teacher, but also I'm really into like crafting baskets, weaving, making stuff like the old ways. So I grew up really with a, like a hands-on. Uh, education and how people made like colonial crafts, for example, like I was, I'm a child of the seventies. So it was like, you know, all right, let's all make these soap from animal fat. You know, mm -hmm. like, I saw that in your special let's, collar today. Yeah. Let's, let's hit, yeah, let's hit, you know, hand, hand dip these candles or whatever. Um, but, um, I also was, you know, exposed to video games when they first started coming out in the console form through ColecoVision and then Atari through friends of mine who had those systems at their houses. So my first like real video game love was I fell in love with the game Mule like in seventh grade I was playing uh -huh. it on a friend's brother's Commodore 64 and I just loved the idea that you could play with somebody else and then also play against the computer like to me that was just so mind-blowing like I'd played Pitfall and you know Mario games and stuff but I'd never really seen that kind of interactivity and then when we finally did get a Super Nintendo and we're, you know, playing other games and stuff, I was like, you know, these games are okay, but they're not as cool as Mule because Mule, you can play with the machine and you can also kind of like basically try to outdo each other in, in the real world space. And so I always had this experience of games where it was like, yeah, no, popular games are cool, but like, I really like these games that do weird, different ways of making you interact. And um, I ended up going to school for... Um, sort of, I did a choose your own adventure major in, in oral narrative and women's studies and computer science. Um, I kind of fell into the computer science thing because I didn't want to take a math class. So I took this class called computer programming as a liberal art. And then I ended up becoming a programmer and really like obsessed almost with like programming and learning how to use computers 
Um, and actually, when I was taking those classes, the, the minor was actually math because there wasn't a computer science department uh, at my university, which was the University of Chicago. So I started working in a computer lab and then I got really interested in working with a, a graduate professor on robots. And one of the people in that team was working on a, an AI that could play The Sims or SimCity for you huh. um, called Mayor. And I started talking with that person about video games. I was like, oh, you know, I used to love video games when I was a kid. And right around that same time, Myst came out. And so then I started playing a lot more video games. And so I was in school in my early 20s, like going from undergraduate into graduate school, thinking, wow, you know, games are so cool. What an interesting, you know, thing. And then at some point it clicked with me that they were actually designed by people <laughs> that like there was a whole community of game designers. Like Will Wright was a person that he had designed SimCity and then it was like a job. And in that moment, I think I, I really, I probably like just all of the neurons in my brain exploded at once. It was like this like massive revelation, like this is a career that people do. And from that point forward, I just wanted to meet game designers and talk to them about games and how did they build them? How did they design them? You know, because they kind of combined all of my interests, computer programming, sound design and music, art, animation, storytelling. And then, of course, this funky interactivity that you get with games like the, the interactivity I was talking about with Mule, where you can be playing against a system that's been designed by a person. But then you can also be playing against people that you are talking to about how the system behaves. And then you can play a game with somebody where you're both trying to figure out how the system behaves. And I just, that combination of like human communication with each other and human computer interaction was just, it was like so sticky for me. And I think it was really the only place I felt at home. Honestly, I went to the Game Developers Conference in 1999, I think was the first time I went. Um, I crashed on a friend's floor in their hotel room. I got a pass by kind of sidling up to someone that was part of the organizing committee and, you know, basically begging them for a free pass because I was a broke ass grad student. Hmm. Um, and then, uh, and pretty much from there, you know, that was the moment that I knew like, okay, these are my people. Like I want to, I want to be around game designers all the time. Like I want to talk to them all the time. So I started volunteering with the IGDA. I got a couple of IGDA scholarships actually, so that I could go to more conferences. Oh, that's great. And yeah. And I started volunteering to help um, design a curriculum to teach games in colleges. Cause I was like, well, Ooh, wouldn't it be so cool if you could actually major in games and game design? Cause at the time you couldn't do that. And then I think the the other really formative experience for me was I had some friends that I'd met in this period of time when I was like a grad student that organized um, this get together in Oakland where we were all going to kind of uh, get a bunch of machines from Intel and then make games on them and then just give them away for free, which at the time was a really bizarre idea. And we decided to call it the Indie Game Jam. And it was like the first <laughs> game jam ever. Um, wow. Yeah. And so I was the first female game jammer on the planet Earth. <laughs> that is so cool. <laughs> yeah. So we started the game jam and then we founded this little get together called the Experimental Gameplay Workshop, which is now in its like 16th year at GDC, where we showed the games off to a bunch of our peers at GDC. And that really sealed the deal for me. I was like, this is the best thing ever. I didn't even really care if I ever had a career commercially in games because most of the people that were at the indie game jam, like, I'm like Chris Hecker and Sean Barrett and, and Brian Sharp, a lot of the people that I'm still really close friends with, Ottman Binstock, who's now at, at Oculus, um, they were all just kind of like bumming around, doing odd jobs. And like some of them had commercial jobs, but mostly they were just kind of doing research in, on the fringes of the games community. And I really was like, I kind of associated myself with that crew. Like, okay, I'm sort of a programmer, but I'm really interested in experimental gameplay. Like John Blow was another founding member of that group. Mm, mm -hmm. um, and this is, you know, this is before there was any XBLA or any of that stuff. You, you really, the only way you could get a game published was if you were a publisher. So if you made a game, you had to go and pitch it to a publisher and then you had to get permission from them to even put it on a disc to put it on a console. So it was a really different environment for me. So I think even as I was becoming a game designer and learning the way to eventually do an interview and get my first job, which was on The Sims, like even as I was entering that path, for me, the idea of game design as a career was more about um, being on the fringes of that sort of more corporate culture and trying to be more artistic and more innovative than it was about like working on my favorite game, you know, which I ended up getting to do. I did end up to getting to work on The Sims, which was great. But when I started off, it was more like I was just really curious to kind of 
make stuff and see what happened. You've really, you know, made that your your path. And I think in a lot of ways that the game industry has has stretched towards you. Yes. And it's, you know, people always say to me, well, it must be so intimidating to be a woman in games or, you know, oh, it's like, it seems like the community is so toxic or this or that. And to me, it's like, you know, there are times when, yeah, like the internet is a jerk, but that, that's just, <laughs> yeah. in some ways, like, that's just like, as we're all seeing now, that's just the internet. I find that the community of game development for the most part, and especially the people that I are in my circle, experimental game designers, I would say, are some of the most open, loving, accepting, diverse people uh, on the planet Earth, because they're real weirdos. You know, they don't really fit in to any one category. I mean, you don't sit at home alone for seven years making Stardew Valley if you just like could just go anywhere and just check in with anybody. Like you're a really unique individual if you do that. You're the kind of person that is like you wake up thinking about things that will make your game better. And like that's that's not a lot of people on this planet, you know. So I think it's a really special community and one that I'm honestly I'm really honored to be a part of and to see it expand the way that it has in the last 10 years has been it's just been amazing. I I would say over the last 15 years the games industry has changed to become so much more than it was when I first started. And, and I'm really, really excited to see the future of, of that change. One of the things we're going to talk more about your work in a little bit, but it has a very human quality. And I think it's also interesting to hear. And I, I hear that also in your career and in, in the way you've developed it. And, um, and that's also been a theme, actually, with some of the, the most successful people I've had on the show. And, and I think it's, it's great. Thank you. It's deliberate. I mean, I think about it often. I ask myself often, you know, what can I do to be of service? Like, what is the, what is the goal? You know, why am I doing what I'm doing? Cause it's a short ride. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. you know, you're only on the planet for, I mean, compared to most rocks, you're like a baby. So <laughs> it's just an interesting, it's interesting to think about how short your time is. And to you, it seems so long, but really like even to your, the tree in your yard, it's probably like, you're just a blink. And we only get to make so many games. That's true. Well, I'm curious to learn about some of your heroes and mentors along the way. I think you may have mentioned some of them already, but I'd love to to maybe pick out two or three that really, really impacted you and the way you think about your work. Yeah, well, I mean, I always sort of say that there were there are two people that were extremely supportive of me doing what I do uh, or very early on in my career. Um, or maybe it would be more like two sets of people. And and one set would be the the set of like looking glass MIT folks who uh, just around the time that I was kind of really seriously considering getting into this as a career, Looking Glass closed. And so that would include the folks from Harmonix and Looking Glass and a lot of other people that end up going off and doing really interesting things. Um, Warren Spector and mm -hmm. uh, Doug Church mm -hmm. and I think Chris and John. Doug, Chris, John and Warren were sort of my go-to mentors for a really long time when I was in grad school. And then the other set of people would be the people that have touched my life in the commercial setting. So people like Will Wright, who sort of was the first person to say to me that I actually sounded like a game designer. He said that to me in like a casual conversation we were having at a, wow. at a conference. And Amazing. I was like, oh my, oh my God, like really? <laughs> I'm just an academic. And he's like, no, you sure, you sure sound like a game designer. And he's been super supportive of me throughout the years. Um, That's a pretty good Will impersonation you got there. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> he's, he's so great. I really, I really appreciate his brain. Um, uh, uh, Rod Humble also was uh, was a fellow collaborator and someone that really helped me. I, I don't um, know Rod. Who's, who's Rod? Rod is um, he was actually uh, sort of running the Sims franchise uh, while I was working there on my Sims. He made a game which we showed at Experimental Gameplay Workshop really early on called The Marriage, which was I one think of my I remember that. favorite. Yeah, one of my favorite experimental games. Yeah, so you're like um, in a room on a on a in an apartment. It's nighttime, and you're trying to go out and you talk. Is this the right? No, no, that's actually facade. Ah, okay, There's I was thinking facade. of facade. Yeah, facade's also that's another colleague of mine actually who I work with at school now, who is also a real supportive person in my life. But um, no, this is just a very abstract game about two shapes, and it's his interpretation of what makes a marriage oh, work right. or what makes a marriage not work, and they kind of float around on screen. Um, it's a very, 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 very abstract game, and it's very, very much told from his unique perspective about his own personal experience of marriage. But to me, what it did at the time was it showed me that you could you could really like conceptualize a process that was so intimate and so complex as a series of actions in a space and have it be really moving. Um, 
And so he was, he was also really supportive. Um, and then there are a lot of women in my later career that have been fantastic, including Siobhan Reddy from Me A Molecule and Angie Smets, who uh, runs the gorilla team that just stripped her, uh, shipped uh, Horizon Zero Dawn. Um, they've been incredibly supportive of me as I've, um, as I've moved forward in my career, not just as a designer, but as a studio CEO and like a person who's a lead in a leadership role. Um, and Kelly Wallach, who uh, now runs the IGF at Mindy Mega Booth. I think those three women have been really, really influential in my ability to see myself as um, as a strong leader who's also sensitive to the needs of others, because I think we get a lot of role models in leadership contexts, especially where it's like you're supposed to be tough, you know. Um, and uh, and I've learned over the years that the the approach of really having that sort of empathetic, like putting yourself in the shoes of the other person first and foremost, seeking to understand before seeking to be understood. Um, those three ladies have really given me a lot of feedback um, about that. I use this question partly to help uh, help me figure out who I want to invite on the show uh, <laughs> next. So that was great because it was it was a lot of people to to investigate. So thanks for that. Now, as far as uh, as far as the next step in the interview, I wanted to ask about. Uh, what you do unique. So we talked about a lot of the people who've influenced you. You know what? I'm going to tell you what my thoughts after, but you already used the word several times. So, I mean, I believe that games are about interactivity and expression of yourself and also expression of, um, of concepts through action. And so, you know, I, while I was in graduate school and starting to do all this outreach work, and volunteering and meeting people, one of the things that I started doing was teaching in this game design workshop uh, run actually by a Looking Glass alum, Mark LeBlanc. And we ended up kind of collaborating. I wrote a paper on which he's an author um, about this philosophy of mechanics, dynamics, aesthetics. And, you know, the way that I, I have that, read that, yeah, that was so very I mean, influential it, on me personally. That's awesome. I mean, I, I when I was first exposed to the workshop, I thought this is amazing. Like, let's really delve into it. And I really I end up dropping out of my Ph.D., in computer science to go work for The Sims. But if I had finished, I mean, you know, when I eventually write a book, which I hope I will someday, it'll be about this this theory because I think it applies to a lot of other things. But, you know, this idea that there are the mechanics of the system, which are the rules, the dynamics of the system, which is the behavior that emerges when you're all sitting around the table, say, playing poker. You know, it doesn't say in poker that you have to bluff, but everybody does it, right? That's a dynamic. And then the aesthetic outcome, which is the feeling of like, schadenfreude that you get when somebody folds and you know that you were bluffing. Like the aesthetic outcome of a game of poker is often that you feel like you're secretly smarter or took advantage of other people. And that feeling of schadenfreude and getting over on other people is what makes poker such a cutthroat game. And so juicy, even when the stakes are really low, there's that, that feeling of cleverness that comes from it, right? And, and unless so, you're losing constantly. Well, that's the other which, thing. Which happens that, a lot. <laughs> the, the problem with poker is that three people at the table, three to five people have this, the, the opposite experience of you yeah. when you win. And I'm actually terrible at poker because my tells are, are too big. So I don't play it professionally by a, by a long shot. But but this is like, you know, this idea that like the feeling or the outcome of the game is a unique expression of its rules and then the interaction of its rules with people has mm -hmm. been the cornerstone of my career. And so when I started thinking about, well, OK, if that's true about games, what I want to build well, I want to build games to give people new feelings. I want to build games to give people feelings about other people. I want to build games to give people feelings of understanding or appreciation, love, sadness, loss, recovery. Like I'm really interested in topics that are about the things that I feel other media doesn't necessarily address as well. It's a lot harder, I mean, to, to really understand what someone totally different from you is going through um, if you're just reading it or watching it, because there's always that room for you being outside looking in. But if you're doing it, if you're walking in that person's shoes moment to moment and having to make tough decisions based on their situation, which you are embodying, mm -hmm. there's there's a moment in there which is so unique to games. And I think the sort of sort of sad truth about games is it's very easy to make a game that's as entertaining as a very popular, you know, um, explosive summer blockbuster movie, or that's as entertaining as, um, you know, uh, a novel that's, um, you know, based on this idea of like, there's a bad guy and you got to get revenge. Like those kinds of things are really easy to do 
with a video game, if, especially if the mechanic that you put in the video game is like shooting or jumping <laughs> because shooting and jumping are really easy to execute on screen. And then you can just slap the story on and there you go. Right. And like, those are the things that we're really best at. Well, but we, we but know what the aesthetic outcome is very, we, we already understand it. And therefore we can, we know also that those mechanics are then going to drive through it's those 100%. dynamics and get there. Exactly. It's like, you don't even have to really do that much work. The really hard thing to do with a game is to, is to make it be really good at what it's uniquely good at, which is using a set of mechanics to create new dynamics in a person that then create this totally unexpected emotional outcome. So like something like Journey, where Genova was like, I want to create a genuine connection between strangers online. When we work backwards from that feeling to, okay, well, what's the dynamic that would really be existing between these two people such that they would feel awe and wonder towards each other and awe and wonder towards the unknown, Okay. We work backwards to the dynamics. We go, okay, well, they'd trust each other and they'd help each other and they'd want to guide each other and they'd want to support one another. Okay, well, then what are the mechanics that lead to that? And like, I'm not going to lie. A lot of the stuff that we tried out was just like platforming. And we even actually at one point as a joke implemented a, 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 a laser cannon idea from the sky hmm. <laughs> just to do it for stress relief. But, but for the most part, we had to work through a lot of really like kind of commonplace mechanics to get to the few simple things that journey does that create that feeling of trust between strangers and eventually lead to that connection. You know, it was really a process of winnowing out. And so for me, I really am interested in that work. I'm interested in thinking about, okay, what if I made a game about lust or what if I made a game about recovery? Or what if I made a game about grief? And then work backwards. Okay, well, what would the dynamics be between the player and the characters in that game or the players that were playing it? And then work backward to that and figure out, okay, what are the rules that the system needs to implement? That work to me is the most fulfilling and interesting work in game design. And, you know, I love playing games that are not that. But when I'm making a game and when I'm collaborating with other people... You know, that's the kind of work that I want to be doing. And I want my games to be different. I want them to be experimental and artistic and to approach the problem of interactivity from a fresh perspective. I always want to be working on something fresh, um, even if it's just fresh for me. So like at some point, maybe I'll build a massively multiplayer roguelike, you know, um, but when I do it, I'm not going to do it from the mechanics forward. I'm going to do it from the feeling backwards. You know, I'm going to figure out those mechanics based on my desire to create a feeling in the in the player. And that that really necessitates that word, which is empathy. In order to understand that goal, you have to put yourself in the shoes of a of an everyday common game player or a person who's never played games or a person who thinks games are horrible and then try to win them over through the process of design. And I think that that's that focus on doing, doing it backwards basically and focusing on the end first a user centered design is sometimes what the way it's referred to in, in uh, more technical circles, that process of user centered activity requires being in the footsteps of that user and thinking about who is the player and why are they playing my game and, you know, what are they going to get out of it? I want to back up for a second and make sure the audience is is with us because uh, the audience is, is, not, is even not just game designers. So when you're talking about mechanics, dynamics, aesthetics, we're saying, hey, what are the rules of the game? That's the mechanics. Yes. The dynamics are the runtime, unpredictable ways that those rules are coming together to create some sort of experience. And the aesthetics is the, the effect in the person who's playing. Well, how does it make them feel? What is the subjective quality? Exactly. Exactly. And so, for example, in, in Journey, which is a game in which you journey to a mountain and you see another person in the distance, maybe, and you can connect with them. What we did was we built an online multiplayer system where you just walking through the world and this other person appears. Normally in online multiplayer games, there's a lobby and you go in and you're dealing with all this stuff, trying to get matched up with someone at the same skill level, blah, blah, blah. We just got rid of all that and made it so that when you're in the game, you start playing. If you're online, other people who are playing online near you show up in your game. And we created a server that made that seamless online connection the focus of the gameplay. And so the core sort of rule of the game is that you need to get from the beginning of the game to the end of the game. And then the other kind of rule that's in that world is that when you are close enough to someone else who's playing, but not so close that they're just going to pop into your universe, they become visible to you. Mm -hmm. So we basically hide all the people that are playing the game except one person. 
and you can connect with one person at a time. And this idea of having a long journey and only being ever to see one other pilgrim on the same route as you go means that you have a choice as a player. Do I stay with this pilgrim or do I leave? Do I try to you know, reinforce the connection with this person and call to them and dance with them and spend time with them? which has its own rewards, or do I walk my own way? And that just even making that decision is a huge, it's a huge difference from the way that most online games are made. And that's just simply through the design of, of, of the mechanics and the resulting dynamics. You know, as you've explained it and explained the uh, Genova's idea of having a game where you could have a real connection with someone online, the insight that I had was it has this feeling of loneliness. Of course it does. Because if you want to connect with someone, you have to first make that, you know, put the, put the people in some amount of isolation, then suddenly the person you interact with, you know, is a warm fire. Exactly. And so, you know, when we were starting to think about building Luna, you know, one of the things I really want people to understand about this character is that the character has made a mistake. And so, you know, when we make games, a lot of times they're about getting revenge or like correcting a mistake, going back in time and fixing something so that like it's better for everybody. But that's not really how life is, you know, like in life you make mistakes and then you have to learn to live with them. And learning to live with your mistakes sometimes means giving up on a relationship or apologizing for something that you said. Sometimes it means letting go of a toxic relationship in your, in your family or in your life. Sometimes it means being very angry and then letting that anger go. But like mistakes are not something that you just erase from your life, right? And so when we when we talked about the game, we first started making the game, Martin, my co-founder, was like, well, what, what should we be doing? I was like, we should think about this question, you know, of mistakes. And so actually for the first, let's say maybe the first year, while we were doing previs and I was like folding paper and doing all these things about transformation and looking at transformative art and fairy tales and the idea of a mistake in our culture... I did one very specific exercise with everyone I met, every new person that I met, whether it was a cab driver or a friend or whatever, for about a year, I would ask them, why do people do things that they know are bad for them? Because in a way, a mistake is kind of like, if it's an accidental mistake, we don't really punish ourselves so much about it. It's when they're deliberate. It's like, I made a choice and it turned out it was really bad for me, or I made a choice and it turned out it was really bad for somebody else. And so I thought, okay, well, I'm really interested in the specific mistake of like, knowing something's not going to be good for you, but doing it anyway. So I'm going to ask everybody about that. And I think what you learn as you, as you begin a project like that, from that perspective of what's the feeling is that you learn so much more about people. If you can be open to that kind of practice and, you know, people would tell me all kinds of stuff. Sometimes people would say, well, they do things that they know are bad for them because they don't care. And they're just like the thrill you know, sometimes when people would say, well, it's because they think the benefits are going to outweigh the cost. And then later they realize they didn't. Um, some people would say, because nobody really knows what a mistake is until it's already happened, you know, and as you start to think it through, you realize, wow, like it's such a rich area to explore a character that makes a mistake, you know, and then has to actually live with that mistake and try to figure it out. The residue of the mistake is the exactly kind of there through the experience. I mean, I, I didn't even realize that aspect of, of the game. Well, of course, I mean, you know, when you play the game, like just with Journey, when you play Journey, I don't know that most people really get the core conversations we had about, you know, the reason that we need empathy in the world and the reason it's important to love other people and treat everyone as unique and special. Like there were a lot of deep conversations that we had about the philosophy of togetherness and our society and its obsession with the fast pace and digital technologies and how, you know, really like how often do you really feel alone in life? Maybe you go on a hike by yourself once a year, maybe. How often do people really feel comfortable putting themselves so far away from all of humanity? And yet, how often do you feel isolated? How often do you feel completely separate, right? Like that's actually very common. It could feel very isolated and separate while sitting on a crowded train, you know, playing your DS, you know, like it's totally possible. And so, but I don't know that everyone that plays Journey gets that feeling from it. But there's, like you said, there's the residue of that conversation in the game. And I think with Luna, the whole point of it for for me and for the people that are working on the game is to sort of think through, well, fairy tales and fables really do try to educate us about mistakes. And what they're trying to tell us more often than not is that you learn from your mistakes, that the mistake can be recovered from, and that there are some kinds of mistakes that even though they seem terrible, turn out to be a real benefit. You know, one of the most common fairy tales is the fool who 
does everything wrong and in the end ends up king. You know, they, they like they, they just defy conventional wisdom and then somehow end up getting this really lucky break. And, you know, that story that like life is a lot more about chaos and lack of control and being open to the future rather than being about doing everything perfectly. I mean, what an amazing message to even even if it's just subconscious to get that across. I think it would be so important and healing for for society. I mean, to get us away from this idea that we can do everything right the first time, which really, honestly, I think if we could, we would we would be robots. And, and, and that wouldn't be so fun. And the mistakes are how we learn. They're who we are even before we make the mistake. Exactly. You know, there was a, a piece that we listened to on NPR when we were first starting to work on Luna about a family that had a trauma in its past that had kind of hidden the trauma from future generations. And at some point, one of the characters in the story said, if you if you deny the mistake, if you deny the reality of that mistake, then you're denying who you are. You're really not acknowledging that this is part of who you are. And it's only by accepting it and actually acknowledging it that you can really become who you want to become because otherwise you're always defined by that denial. And I thought that was just so hmm. interesting, you know? Yeah, absolutely. And, and, you know, society sometimes figures that, figures that out when we memorialize things and, and sometimes we don't. Yeah. Yeah. I think it's a very interesting process. So, you know, to bring it back to this idea of aesthetics, this aesthetic outcome of being about transformation through trauma being about, about the value of learning from tough situations or unexpected change, that really is like, I want that to be clear somehow in the game at its end. And I want players to experience a sense of, of letting go, of letting go of something that is deep inside of them, giving themselves permission to let it go. I think that the, if every person that played Luna would just reach down inside and take a little scribble that was in there that was something that they felt bad about and let it go, that would be such an amazing thing. You know, it's a ter it's a terribly lofty goal. And like, I think, you know, being an artist, one always has goals that are much larger than what one can accomplish. But I believe in having those goals from the beginning. Have you been to Burning Man? Uh, no, I have not. Slightly actually. Off topic, I've never but... been because I'm, I'm, I'm very pale and I'm afraid of getting a sunburn, but people always encourage me to go. I will go sometime. There's a big part of the experience that has to do specifically with letting go. That's why I brought it up. Um, there's a, every year there's a temple built and people bring uh, memories of things that they've lost or mistakes that they've made. And they, they put it up in the temple and, and the whole thing is burned. And it's a very cathartic, very sad moment. Uh, a lot of people are crying. Yeah, you know, I think that our ability to sort of acknowledge failure and to live through it is it's it's not helped by a lot of cultural messages and especially marketed messages about, you know, what's the perfect person, what's the perfect woman, what's the perfect life, what kind of car you should drive, you know, what it what it means to be successful. Um, I have friends, I have a lot of friends now who are in their 40s and 50s who are saying to themselves, you know, I'm going to give myself permission to stop working in this career path and do something I really love. I'm going to go to Burning Man and build something huge in the desert and set it on fire. That's actually something that someone said to me <laughs> literally, day, literally days ago, um, who'd spent a long time um, building a career for themselves. Um, they're an immigrant. They like worked super hard and they got to where they are now. And they realized, you know, this ladder kind of, it's like, I'm on the last rung now. Like I'm here, I made it. And now I want to do something else. And like confronting that is so hard. It's so scary. And at the same time, it's like, if you don't confront it, I mean, you're not really living, right? That's, that's, I think when I, when I, when people ask me why I like game design, I say, I love game design because it is so hard. <laughs> it is so hard. I ask my students all the time, like, okay, let's, let's say you wanted to make a game about a child that you had that died of cancer. How would you do it? Like, how did Ryan and his team come up with the ideas for that drug and cancer? What, like, really ask yourself, how do you make the experience of being told by a doctor that your child is going to die in three months a thing that is interactive that also is respectful of that process and also gives you a sense of what they went through. Like, how would you do that? It's so hard. You know, how do you build a game that's all about perspective and looking at the world from a different perspective? Like you have to basically do all this integrative and innovative graphics programming. You know, when John built the witness, he had to do a lot of work on the game engine side to make the puzzles in that game possible. Like it's some of the most amazing programming I think in a video game, like the, it's very hard to do design 
when you start to think about like game design as the possibility space of all human feeling and not just points or getting rank or, you know, getting all the gear so that you can kill the giant dragon at the end of a, of a series of, of rooms, you know, it's a lot more than that. Absolutely. And this, you know, this way of processing design is very, you know, it's not the typical conversation uh, that that happens and certainly that that I have. Um, mm-hmm. And I love it. For me, it's very exciting to to talk about it like this. I have I have two two questions about this that I want to talk to you about. One is how, how do you do it? I mean, you've talked about putting yourself in the shoes of the player. You've talked about kind of understanding the experience itself. Any tips on connecting those lines? And then and then secondly, and we can get back to this for for, you know, designers who are maybe working on a more traditional game. Uh, you know, how can they fit some of this into their work? So I think that people ask me a lot of times, where do I start? And what I ask them to do is to just imagine the most simple paper prototype possible, even to just do it with like playing cards or a couple of dice and a hand handmade deck. Try to think about how to get to the feeling that they want to get to. So, you know, um, I have a, I had a student at school, actually, she's still, she's getting ready to graduate soon, um, who was in an autobiographical games class that I taught. And uh, she lives with autism. She's on the spectrum. And she wanted to give people the feeling of passing with a disability, like, okay, what does that feel like? And so she modified a game of set, which is a matching game that you play with cards, where she gives everybody a list of uh, five handicaps, five disabilities, five challenges, you know, depending on the way you want to sort of think about them and um, five abilities, maybe. Um, and uh, and they, they, they greatly constrain the way that you play the game. And then you roll a die and you get one and no one knows uh, what your disability is. But as you're playing, they may become a parent. So in the game, you can match sets of things that are colored purple, or you can match sets of things that have particular shapes in them or certain numbers of things. And one of the handicaps may say, you can't pick up anything that is purple, or you can't uh, match things with this particular shape in it or whatever. And these disabilities, as you continue to play, because everyone is looking at a shared set of cards and everyone can see all the sets, if you consistently don't call out a set because it has something to do with your disability, someone else can guess it and they can take half your points and then you're out of the game. And this idea of like there being a public information, you know, common understanding about what is going on and that you can't participate in that sort of dialogue because of this, this way of seeing um, was so immediately apparent to people that, that the fear of getting caught out is really, it's very high, right? And the way that you get to that idea is, is by thinking about what am I really trying to communicate with this notion of passing, you know, what is it? Passing is really about the fear of not passing, you know? And so it's really almost like a philosophical introspection into the goal of the game. And the easiest way for me to get started is often, yeah, just put something down on some cards, try to come up with a little bit of randomness using dice or card passing rule and just like, just try to get to that feeling, um, doing a very basic 2d prototype, uh, where the motion is movement was one of the first things that we did with journey, just like sit down and build a top down 2d prototype of multiple units moving in a space and then separate those people and only let them talk by hitting the space bar. And when they hit the space bar, it just says, Hey, Hey, and that's it. You know, limited amount of communication, limited amount of information, but you have to collaborate to get out of this like kind of top down dungeon. That was the first prototype for Journey. For for Luna, because we knew we wanted the touch and like the idea of sort of getting in touch or like transformation to be center to it. We started off with folding paper origami and talking about what folding origami felt like and then moved from origami into systems of untangling lines. Like the puzzles in the game are actually about kind of cat's cradle type scrambles, um, which has that similar feeling of kind of disambiguation or like finally seeing the shape in the lines because paper folding is actually really dry and kind of hard to do in, in, uh, in a video game context. But that idea of sort of sorting through the shape Mm -hmm. and figuring it out, almost like untangling a necklace or like a pile of string, that feeling is really satisfying. And it's also, uh, we found really, it lies at the base of relaxation. A lot of things people do like with their hands to relax, like say knitting, you know, or quilting, 
they have this quality of like kind of mindless movement of the hands. And like, I really love that idea of like being able to get into that zone of just moving things to see what you see. So I think a lot of it is about really staying minimal. The worst thing you can do when you start a game design is think about what the world will look like and over-focus on the art or think about what the story will be and over-focus on the narrative. Because if you can write a really great narrative and then have crappy movement mechanics, crappy, you know, jumping or whatever it is that you end up using. It's gaminess people, will be bad. Yeah, gaminess will be bad. Exactly. So like you really need to think about that mechanics to aesthetics pipeline. What is the feeling going to be because of what you do? And then I, someone actually asked me this in class the other day, like we, they said, you never mention the art style when you're talking about this stuff. And I was like, that's because the art style is secondary to understanding why the player is doing what they're doing. Because if it's just art style, then, I mean, then why not make it a film? You know, why not make it a picture? You know, you could, con- you can convey the same feeling in a, in a, in a still image. If it's really a game, then it has to be about what the player is doing. And, and a, I really a believe film that. shouldn't be just about art style either. I mean, that would, that would also be kind of a cop out. Yeah. Well, you know, I'm actually kind of a fan of like really deeply philosophical films with almost no dialogue, like, uh, uh, Solaris, the original Solaris. No, I love that movie. I love, <laughs> I love that, movie. that movie. I love that movie so much. It's one of my favorite movies of all time. And, you know, even like the Blade Runner with no voiceover, like the director's cut, love it. Like I really, really love, um, atmospheric photographic films, you know, that are very much about the sequencing of images and the way that that makes you feel beyond, you know, beyond dialogue. And it's one of the reasons why like games like Journey or Luna, I've always been so adamant that we not lean on dialogue, if at all possible. It's not in the art style. It's in the it's in the structure. Yes, it's in. the Yeah, actually, he has a really fantastic book. Um, uh, I think it's called Painting in Time, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, I'm going to forget now, but um, it's a beautiful book about the process of coming up with these films that he's made. And I mean, Tarnovsky isn't just an, a genius. So it's, it's very like, it's almost like reading Werner Herzog. It like has such a, has a deep quality to it, but right, um, yeah, no, they're very much about juxtaposition. Yeah. Penetrating. Exactly. That's a great word for it. In a way you help me actually discover what I think the answer is. But my question was about, you know, for, for maybe uh, game designers who aren't, you know, whole cloth coming up with a new concept, oh, right. but working within the constraint of a, of a pre-existing, you know, design or a pre-existing uh, brand, how can they, you know, bring some of that in to what they're doing? So when I first started working at The Sims, I was just working on The Sims 2. I was working on an expansion pack open for business and just responsible for object design and working with all the animators and engineers to make objects for the expansion pack. And it was like, honestly, one of my favorite jobs of all time because I got to play my favorite game mm-hmm. and and I didn't have any direct reports. And so I could just go to work, do awesome work and then go home and play more games. And so it was really low stress, high impact. But then eventually I got promoted to work on a new version of The Sims for the Wii, which hadn't been released yet. So this was one of EA's very first Wii titles called My Sims. And My Sims was supposed to be a game that would be more casual than The Sims. And because it was a console title and it was going to be coming out on the Wii, we really wanted it to resonate in Japan. So I spent a lot of time in Tokyo and Kyoto interviewing girls who could potentially become Sims fans. Mm -hmm. But, you know, Sims hadn't really picked up in Japan. So there was like a lot of discussion about Why? And one of the things that I decided to do when I was working on the game, um, my friend Joe Marish, Marish actually was the one that um, talked to me about doing this. He said, this is the core flow of The Sims. And he kind of drew that out for me. And then he was working on Sims Castaway, which is one of my favorite Sims uh, offshoots. And he's like, this is the core loop of Sims Castaway, which is really about finding objects and crafting stuff. And he was like, what's your version of The Sims going to be? What's the core loop going to be about? And I went and I looked at both of those loops and I decided that like the aspect of he had really focused on this idea of doing more with less because The Sims is generally about buying stuff. And he was like, well, okay, if you're on a desert island, you have to build everything from scratch. So the whole game is going to be about this cool crafting system. And for me, I, I really loved the idea of crafting and I had really loved Animal Crossing. So I was like, what if this is a really cheapy style version of The Sims, but instead of crafting for yourself, you were crafting for other people. You were giving things away. What if the fundamental loop of The Sims in this game wasn't about getting more stuff to get promoted, but it was about giving away things to people who wanted to move to the town so they could basically start their own little business there. Ah, so you okay. start you start off with a little town that's empty, and then as you basically collect items and build furniture for these 
these little people out of like pixel blocks, basically, they can start their own little setup in your town and they come to the town because you've basically welcomed them with these gifts. And the more you do that, the more diverse your town gets, the more interesting it gets. And then there was the second part of the design, which unfortunately did never get built out due to just the platform constraints, but I had really wanted it to be online so that you could have a little town of my Sims who were the ones that you had chosen to support. Like, let's say you really liked the gothy ones and um, you really liked the foodies. That was another set of, of characters you could get in your town. Um, you could keep uh, like a sporto sim that was really into athletics and then just send them to your friend's town to hang out with the other sportos. And then they'd come back and they'd bring cool presents. So that the idea sort of, which is very typical for me now that I look back on my career, was that your town could be special for you in the sense that like you would put together the characters and the little play sets that you liked, but it could also be inclusive of somebody that was just kind of different and still celebrate their difference in a way that didn't compromise your vision for what the town should look like. And I really, really like that idea now that I, now that I've gotten some, some distance from the game, it's been a long time since it was built, you know, even though that feature never got implemented because the, the, we didn't ship with an online capacity right away. Um, I still, I still think that this idea of giving things away um, to to build a diverse community and then letting people come and go as they please as a way of getting sort of revitalized and and rejuvenated and bringing their creativity back to the to the center is those are just really interesting ideas and I I, I always think like oh, I'd love to do another game like that where the online really was a strong component and you could you could kind of care for a little group of creatures or people or whatever and still have them not need to all be the same in order to get along. In fact, actually, if you think about it, Watam, which is one of the games that we're making here at Phenomena, is a little bit like that. I think a lot of Kata's vision is similar and that it's about a lot of different people, little people that are all different, but they all get along to create, ultimately to create a shared common goal. And so, you know, those kinds of ideas, you can work them into a very big franchise. You can even sort of do a franchise split and still have it remain core, like the Sims games are still Sims games, but you can kind of look at the core loop and then just make an adjustment for feeling. And like in my case, this was an adjustment to make the game feel more focused on community and building community. Um, I think that that's actually a really fun exercise. And I often tell young designers who are like, oh, I really want to make my own game, but I have to go get a, a like a regular job or in someone else's game. I always tell them that when I first started, that was one of the best things that I did in my career was working on a game that someone else had already designed, just learning how games work, seeing how the sausage gets made. You know? Yeah, absolutely. And like, and like getting good at meeting my commitments and like managing my time. Like those were so much more important than my gigantic game ideas at the time. Um, and I think it's something that we overlook, especially earlier in our careers. I just had a similar conversation with someone who was who was out of school and, and uh, wanted to to connect with me. And it's like, hey, in two, three, four years, you can you can still revisit those ideas, that company, uh, and you'll be so much better equipped. Oh, totally. Yeah, there's so many little things that you don't learn in school. You know, um, it's imp it's so important to be able to communicate with integrity and honesty and to let go of your own failures and other people's failures, not hold grudges against yourself or other people on your team, not start fires, you know, all these things. And, you know, not to say that I have nailed any of those. I mean, I'm just as bad as anybody else when it comes to being totally honest and, and confronting things when they present themselves as opposed to putting it off. But but those are the things that you have to learn through practice. And it's like you can take a class in it in school, but you can't really learn it in school. You have to learn it on the ground. And being able to do your job really well while learning that, I think, is really important. Hmm. Well, I actually wanted to ask you a little bit about that because, you know, with everything you do, the teaching, running the company, designing and all the community work you do, you must be some sort of productivity guru. And, I, <laughs> and I'm just curious uh, how you manage all that. Well, you know, it's funny. I'm actually teaching a class right now about um, it's called game design experience, and it goes with a, uh, a game programming experience class. It's two classes that are taught at the same time. And so they have class on Monday, Wednesday, Friday with my friend Nathan, and then they have class on Tuesday, Thursday with me. And it's all the sophomores in the the bachelor's programs that we have at UC Santa Cruz and games. And so they're just getting ready to go from doing solo games projects into a group game project. And at the beginning of class, um, every time we have class, I have them all sit still. And then I say, okay, how are we doing? And we all say together, 
I'm doing the best that I can because that's really, Mm. you just have to assume that everyone is doing the best that they can. I think for a long time, because I'm someone who loves lots of things and I love to give back and I love to be social and I love to sort of like learn and also to teach and to travel and all and do all these things, make stuff. I definitely always felt like, oh my gosh, there's a million things I want to do. I'm going to run out of time. never going to have enough time. I'm always rushing, rushing, rushing. But as I've gotten older, I've actually learned that the most important thing is just taking the time to focus on the goal and to think what, what am I doing? And then to do that as best as you can. And so I make them use a tool, which I just started using last year um, on the advice of one of my, my older mentors, Bob, uh, Bob Bates, who's an old uh, game designer, uh, so like a very, very classic, uh, you know, text-based adventure game designer who's like really kept up with the industry and written some really great books. And is just still, I think, one of, one of, the, one of the more influ- influential people in my career, um, him and, and Noah Falstein both. And uh, Bob was saying, like, this book is so great. And the book is called The Productivity Planner. And it's, you can buy it on Amazon. It's like 25 bucks. It's black and it, I get the one with, uh, it's undated. So you can put your own dates in it. And it's a process by which every week you write down the top five things that need to get done that week. And then the next five and the next five. And I kind of think of those as being urgent and important, uh, urgent and important. (laughs) So really like stuff that's like kind of crisis mode or needs to get done really quickly. It just popped up out of nowhere then the stuff that is like, you need to do it because if you don't do it in the long run, it's going to be a real pain. And then the stuff that like you really think is important to do in your life and you want to plan. So like you bucket those things out for each week. And then on every day you sit down in the morning and you write down the number one thing that you want to get done that day. And you don't do anything else until you get it done. And the process is very helpful for me. It really helps me each week think about, okay, where am I totally in terms of like, all of the things that I'm managing, which of them are kind of boiling up to the top, which one are generating tasks that need to be planned and which ones are like things that really need to sort of, you know, get into the flow of motion so that they can move forward, unblock people, make other opportunities available. And I use that pretty religiously. It's very, very helpful for me. I've also gone through periods of really scheduling in my life out in like a Google spreadsheet where I kind of maintain those buckets more manually and more granularly, like granularly over the course of a day. But um, I find that when I'm doing it with a Google spreadsheet, I get a little bit fussy and kind of like picky. And because you can type really quickly, you kind of jam stuff in there without really thinking about it. Whereas having to write it longhand in the notebook forces me and there's limited space and I don't like to have scratches in there and like things written out and then crossed off. So I really kind of try to really be particular about what I write down. And then at the end of the week, there's a process by which you evaluate all the things that you were supposed to do and you look at your throughput. So for every task, it says how many Pomodoros, which is a 25 minute segment of time, did I spend on this task? And so Pomodoros kind of allow you to plan for 25 minutes of work and then a bathroom or a water break or a stretch break. And um, it's a very healthy way also to sort of portion out your time. So I when I was younger, especially when I was programming in grad school, I would sometimes just stay at home in my pajamas for a week, you know, drinking coffee and not sleeping and programming and just being totally obsessed with making something work. Right. Um, and as I've gotten older and really learned what my strengths are, um, and what rejuvenates me, I found that it's really bad for me actually to be locked away for days at a time, just answering email or just drawing or just programming or just, you know, you know, making plans and schedules. Like if I, if I really do that, I get a lot done, but by the end of it, I feel really, um, inhuman. <laughs> feel Burned like, out. Yeah. Just, 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 yeah. Just like, yeah. Crusty and fried and like not happy. And, you know, one of the core things about phenomena when we started the company was that Martin and I really wanted to build a deliberately developmental organization that allowed all of us to get to the place where we could plan our days not just based on what needed to be done, but on what was important to us and what our values were. And I think it is really hard. I'm not going to lie. It's really hard to run a commercial business that way because so many other businesses that you're interacting with are not run that way. Like you'll get email from a publisher at, you know, midnight on a Sunday and, you know, get in in the morning and think, oh my God, I didn't answer that email. It's like, well, of course you didn't. You were asleep. (laughs) But, you know, when you, when you encounter other work cultures, that are toxic and that don't actually deal with goal setting and specific measurable throughput kind of analysis towards those goals, 
then it's very difficult to maintain your own process in the face of that. But if you do it yourself personally, it's easier to lead by example and to show others that it does work and that you can have effectively a really fulfilling life where you do the things that are important to you because they're important to you and you let go of the things that maybe you might assume you need to do that you don't. Like, I don't really spend a lot of time watching television. I don't watch television. I've never seen Game of Thrones. Like, I don't. I don't watch TV. It's pretty good. I haven't. I'm sure it's great. And I'll binge watch (laughs) it at some point when I have shipped my game and like and have a whole summer to lay around and do nothing. But um, but I also don't really miss it because I read obsessively. I read tons. I I bought like 30 books off of Amazon this weekend. I, I, I buy used books like crazy. I have a huge library. I have a library here at the office. I have a library at my house. In Santa, in Santa Cruz, and I have a library in, in my house in San Francisco because I, I have two little apartments that I rent. I just fill them with books. Like, I love reading, and I can read on my own time, and I can read across a variety of subjects, and then I can create little maps between the subject matter in a way that is just so pleasing to me, as, whereas with watching television or, like, YouTubes and stuff like that, I just can't get that experience. Like, I'm really about ingesting information through books. So you're about depth, Robin. Yeah. I'm, I'm all about like connecting things. And like, for me, the experience of watching television is an experience of shutting off and just absorbing what someone else is showing me. It's like watching a movie. I love to do it, but I don't do it that often because I would much rather be spending my time learning and being creative with what I learn and kind of connecting that to other people. I just recently did a, um, a survey online called VIA. It's the VIA character analysis, like creativity survey. And you fill out a bunch of questions. It's like anything, you know, like a Myers-Briggs or whatever. But, um, you know, it tells you kind of what your, what your values are, like what your top strengths are. And when you do the self-analysis, um, it's interesting, but then you can also, if you want to, you can have other people do it for you, which is also interesting. Um, and my top strengths for my own analysis were creativity, kindness, love of learning, curiosity and appreciation of beauty and excellence. I'm like, when I look at that list, I think, yes, that's exactly, that's exactly what I value. (laughs) That's like what I want to put in front of myself every day. Like I don't really spend a lot of time reading Twitter because it's mostly negative and it's people complaining or it's distracting and silly. And like all of the Twitter feeds that I follow are artists or people that talk about art or people that talk about science. So there's the love of learning and the appreciation of beauty and excellence. And occasionally I follow podcasts and science stuff because I'm interested in learning and, and, and I'm curious about weird subjects. Um, it's not that I'm not active and that I don't have opinions about how we should treat one another and how much kindness is required to make the world a more peaceful and loving place. But I just don't immerse myself in knowing about it in detail because I know that it's there and my best effort is to resist through my creativity and my kindness and my love of learning, right? So I really encourage everybody who wants to be productive and do a lot to sort of sit down and ask themselves, what are their goals and what are their values? And then to just always be asking yourself like this week, like what can I do to get myself closer to those values? How can I drive my game design or this job that I have to do right now, or, you know, this relationship that I'm in towards the things that are about my values. If everybody did that and everybody was kind to children, the world would be a much better place. Well, I think that says it all, Robin. We're going <laughs> to, we're going to put, we're going to put links to the uh, productivity planner and to the via strengths finder yeah. uh, on, on the blog post. And also, um, you know, we'll, we'll put links to phenomena and, um, any, anything else where we, you know, people can find and connect with you. It was great having you and talking to you and learning from you and being inspired by you. Thank you very much for coming on the show. Thank you so much for having me. It was really great to talk to you. So there you go. That was Robin Hunnicky. I had a great time having her on the show. I learned a lot. I was inspired. I really appreciated her artistic approach, her emotions first approach, and her empathy first approach. So all those pieces meant something to me and were something that I took away in terms of how I'm going to approach some of my work. And uh, and I hope that you will as well. And if you are getting something out of these interviews, if you're finding them useful, if you're finding them inspirational, if they're impacting the work that you're doing, I would love to hear about it either shooting me an email, jordan at brightblack.co, no M, or if you would write a review on iTunes. And you can do that, obviously, just by heading to iTunes and doing it the usual way. Or if you head to 
playmakerspodcast.com. You'll find links there to do it. You'll also find links to everything that came up in the talk with Robin. So all the game designers, all the games, the productivity planner that she mentioned, all that stuff is linked to right there. And you can also find out how to get in touch with Robin because we link to her Twitter and also to Phenomena, the company page where you can see what they're up to and the art for their games is fantastic. So take a look. I think you'll dig it. Don't forget to sign up for the Playmakers Insiders newsletter. You can also do that at playmakerspodcast.com. You'll get weekly updates about upcoming guests and some bonus information as well. In the last episode that I put out, or in the last letter that I put out, I was recommending a very cool newsletter that I've discovered called Indie Weekly. You can find it at indieweekly.co. Again, no M. And uh, it's a really cool newsletter where you can get like a quick weekly update with game industry news. They talk about some of the notable releases. They talk about funding a little bit and they keep you up with big picture stories as well. The last uh, newsletter that I got talked about how Battle.net is having their first non-Blizzard game uh, come to it for distribution. So that's a new, a new thing where Bungie is going to have Destiny up on Battle.net. So that's that's kind of crazy. So anyway, IndieWeekly.co is a, is a cool newsletter. You might want to check it out. And Playmakers Insiders is pretty cool too. You can check that out at Playmakers Podcast. Dot com. That's all I've got for this episode of Plamacas. I swear, that joke's going to get old. That is going to get old fast. All right, I'll see you in the next episode.